And welcome back to the Dino Vidal the show. Right now, very happy to welcome Max Fisher to the show. He's covered the impact of social media around the world for the New York Times. He's got a compelling new book out, The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world. Max, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. So the, it's interesting in your book, you write how, in a way, that the modern, the dawn of the social media era started by almost by accident with Facebook in 2006, looking for something to help with their business model. I found that really uh, interesting and provocative. Could you share a little bit about what it was, what they were doing, what they found? Sure. So if you can remember all the way back to the dark ages of 2005, 2006, if you went on social media, it looked like, um, if you remember MySpace, Orkut, the kind of like old style pages where it would just be your page and your profile page, you would visit other people's profile pages. And it was a little boring, but it also, and this is going to be relevant for later, turns out not to have caused any of the horrible problems with hate, misinformation, extremism that we now associate with social media. And that all started to change at 2006 when Facebook introduced this new idea called the newsfeed. And what this was where now instead of, you know, if I wanted to see what you were up to, I would go to your profile page specifically, I would go to my homepage. And the homepage would be a selection of posts and content that the system would decide to show me from all across my network, everyone who I might have followed or been friends with, every little detail of what they were doing, it would show to me in this kind of reverse chronological scroll of everything that was happening. And if you remember when that first got rolled out, I was in college, so it was a big deal at the time. When that got rolled out, a lot of people got really, really mad because the idea was that then your homepage would be like a party that all your friends were always at, but some people didn't like it because it showed every little twitch and post and like that you had on the platform would get broadcast out to everyone you knew. Some people found that to be invasive. So they started these groups called, you know, F news feed, get rid of news feed. We hate you, Mark Zuckerberg, that were angry about it. And it was so, it's in retrospect, it's so funny what happened because these groups were basically the first thing to go really, really viral on social media. Um, what would happen is every time somebody would join one of these groups or click like on it, um, it would broadcast that out to everybody on their network. And one thing that we know now that they did not know at the time when they started these social networks is that this happened to hit on a certain emotion that is incredibly powerful on social media called outrage, moral outrage. And that just means anger towards something that you perceive as a social transgression, as a transgression against the group as a whole. So what happened is that any given user would log on, they would see all of this activity in this group and it would hit on this thing in their brain where they would see their peers are expressing outrage and they would feel a compulsion to join in, even if they did not actually care about newsfeed, which most people didn't. So they would click the like button to, or the join button to, and it snowballed. And, it, and again, in something that at the time was kind of left off, but in retrospect looks kind of ominous, this gathered so much momentum that people actually started to um, mistake their kind of superficial participatory online outrage for real sincere outrage, which is something we know now with the social platforms can do really well. They can actually, by exposing you to enough of this feeling that your friends appear to be having online, you start to feel it yourself. And then pretty quickly that turned into these actual like mobs gathered outside of Facebook's headquarters to demand them to switch off the newsfeed. So it was this incredible demonstration of how this piece of technology, the newsfeed and the way that it just happened to show all of this social activity at once hitting on this emotion that is now the central emotion of social platforms, gathering so quickly that it completely overran the platform and then spurred this real life action that nobody would have taken otherwise because nobody actually cared enough to do it if not for the manipulative aspects of the platform. And a lot of people at Facebook saw this and they said, oh my God, we have to turn off the news feed. People hate it. But Mark Zuckerberg, who is, uh, was, was insightful about this, he said, no, this is actually a demonstration of how powerful our platform is and how effective it can be at galvanizing people and getting them to do what we want them to do, which is spending a lot of time on the site, spreading whatever emotions to one another, whatever activity to one another will get them to engage a lot online. And this has now become the template for everything on social right. media and the way that it bleeds off into our real world. And it's interesting how 
that was stumbled upon because I think people know now, especially from the hearings a few years ago, maybe it was a year ago, time blurs, but how the idea of divisiveness and anger is the emotion that keeps people engaged on social media and how they, they sort of discover that. That, you know, you know that in your book that Facebook realized their algorithms, algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. And I think people would be shocked. What do you mean? Well, I'm not attracted to divisiveness. But at the same time, you wrote that dopamine is social media's accomplice inside your brain. And while dopamine is usually known for something positive and good, it can be hijacked, as you point out, for, for bad purposes, sinister, like James Bond villain purposes. Tell us a little bit about how the dopamine, which usually people hear, oh, that's a good thing, it's a nice release, how social media was able to turn that around and use that to get us to engage more, almost subconsciously. So dopamine is a, it's a neurotransmitter and it's a little chemical that your brain releases whenever you do any kind of activity that um, you have learned to internalize as rewarding. And that is, uh, it used to be referred to as the, the happiness um, neurotransmitter because it's when you get a hit of dopamine, it, it's like when something is really satisfying, you know, you take a first bite into a sandwich, that's a dopamine rush, but they don't call it that anymore. They call it the training neurotransmitter now because they've come to realize that what, it, what it's doing is not actually making you happy. It's giving you this little drug-like hit, your brain is, that is meant to compel you to repeat a behavior because your brain believes that that behavior is somehow good for you or something that you should pursue. And you know, in a, in a world where we're getting dopamine because we, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm having a seltzer right now. When I opened the little top on the seltzer, I got a little dopamine hit because I've learned an association between that noise of the top opening and getting the seltzer, which I really enjoy. We, we have but, become Pavlovian dogs, right? We've become oh, Pavlovian yeah, dogs. It's a, I mean, I think you know exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. So please continue. Right. It's, Go ahead. Yeah, it's Pavlov's dog. That's exactly right. It's, it's, it's training, it's conditioning. Um, the model that the social networks use very explicitly, um, and you can go back into you know, 10, 15 years ago and the conferences in Silicon Valley and the way that people would talk to each other, they were quite open about this at the time. The model that they developed the social platforms on is the slot machine. And if you look at it, you start to see the similarities with the colors, the flashing lights. If you get a like, or if you pull down the refresh, your phone vibrates a little bit, that's called haptic feedback. And this is all meant to feel literally like pulling the lever on a slot machine. And the slot machine is designed much like social media is designed to give you a dopamine hit every time you open it up, every time you get a like, get you a retweet. And that makes it physically, chemically addictive. It is an actually addictive substance in the way that it uses these dopamine to compel you when you feel sad, when you feel bored, if you feel tired, that your brain starts to search out for that dopamine hit. And because these social platforms that we carry around with us all the time, it's like a slot machine that we have in our pocket, is right. such an efficient, effective delivery mechanism for dopamine. It's why the average American checks social media something like a couple dozen times a day. So imagine if there was a slot machine lever that we were all pulling a couple of times, a couple dozen times a day, and you start to see how incredibly addictive this is. But what's dangerous about it isn't just that it addicts you so that you want to spend a lot of time on Twitter, spend a lot of time on Facebook. It's that it addicts you specifically to um, chase and perform and experience certain emotions and behaviors that in any other context, we actually find to be very unpleasant. Um, and this is something that, again, if you use social media, it sounds familiar. It's like, boy, it's addictive, but I'm not happy when I'm on it. I'm upset. I'm angry when I'm on it. I'm sad when I'm on it. So why is that? And it's because you have been physically addicted to pursue these, these very specific emotions and behaviors that it might feel like, oh, it's because politics are so upsetting. It's because the news is upsetting. That's why I feel bad when I'm on social media. And that's actually not the case. You, the reason it feels bad is because social media's algorithms and the systems of government have trained you to experience these emotions and to participate in these behaviors that are bad for you, but that are very good at making you spend a lot of time online and at doing things in a certain way online that will compel other people to spend time on the platforms too. It is remarkable how we're being manipulated. We are the product. Check with Max Fisher about his book, The Chaos Machine. You know, I first became aware, I guess from those uh, testimony and there was a documentary maybe a year or two ago on Netflix about social media, then I became more aware of it because I have a Facebook page for my show. 
And I post, I'm very liberal and I post progressive stuff. And my goal is not to troll the right. My goal is to share this information with people on my side. Yet these Trump supporters would find it and comment. And, and I, I had at one point a pin thing. If you're a Trump supporter, you're only here because you're being manipulated by Mark Zuckerberg. You shouldn't be here. Like, I don't want you here. And that kind of thing. They didn't ward them off, but maybe some it did because they got, we were being manipulated to fight each other. I will, I'll go on Twitter to fight. If I'm going to fight, that's, that's the wild west. In my mind, Facebook is for my friends and fans of the show and supporters of the show. And I'm like, why do you, why do you got to post this garbage to comment on me? And, and then they would post every now and then, why is your, your terrible article in my feed? I'm like, I didn't put it in your feed. It's not me. I don't want it in your feed. It's them. Let's, let's unite against them. Uh, but I don't know how that works. So that was very real world for me to see this happening. Yeah, it's it, what you were saying is something that the platforms do very deliberately is that they will show you uh, whatever side of whatever the disagreement or whatever the in-group out-group happens to be in, in the United States context, it's, it's partisanship, it's liberal versus conservative, it will show you a incrementally more extreme versions of whatever um, opinion you already hold or whatever social group you identify with it which true more extreme versions of that and it will also show you the most egregious and offensive and upsetting versions of the other side that it could possibly dig out because it has learned that this taps into this tribalistic identity that you know to be fair it comes from us it comes from inside of our nature but the platforms have learned very effectively how to pull that out because it engages us but what's significant about that is not just that it makes us fight online, which I, you know, I for a long time thought that that was kind of the worst that happens. They're like, oh, we go on Twitter and the, the opinions are dialed up a little bit and we argue a little bit more and that's annoying and it's unpleasant, but how consequential can that actually be? And one of the reasons that I spent four or five years on this book was that we have a lot of actually hard empirical scientific research now that the hours and hours that we spend on these platforms participating in this, not just consuming it, but participating in it, changes the way that we view um, politics, it changes the way that we consume information, and it changes the way that we see each other. It quite literally makes us more extreme as people, even when we're not online. There's this uh, really compelling study that tracked uh, what happens when someone uh, sends a couple of outrage tweets and uh, gets the positive feedback for it. The really important effect is you, you know, you send the tweet fighting and then you get a lot of engagement. You get a lot of likes and retweets and people on your side who agree with you because the platform shows your outrage tweet to lots of people and you internalize that sense of validation until you become more outraged yourself, including when you were online, or excuse me, ex including when you are offline, when you're not even dealing with social media. And the effects of that range to Partisanship, which obviously has a lot of things that are making it higher, but it also, uh, there's some real evidence that it is a major driver of violent hate crimes. There's a real evidence that it's a driver of the increase in racial acrimony, religious acrimony, and uh, religious and racial violence, up to and including literal genocide. The, the genocide in Myanmar that killed tens of thousands and displaced millions of people the, even the United Nations came out and said that they believed it was driven in large part by Facebook and a couple of other platforms spinning up the sentiment so effectively in such a large share of the population. And, and you touch on that and you've written about that. I mean, what, what can you share with people who didn't follow that, the role of Facebook and WhatsApp? WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. That, like, can you sort of frame it that when Facebook and WhatsApp are doing their thing, what the real world impact were there? And then when they stopped and they were not being able to be used, what was the real world impact on terms of violence? In, in Myanmar, you mean? Yes. So the Facebook and, and WhatsApp kind of, the, the two platforms end up linking together a lot and how they used, especially in developing countries where um, uh, some post, I'll give you an example from Myanmar. There will be a post that expresses extreme hatred towards um, the Rohingya minority in that country, which is the, the genocide that happened there in 2017 to 2018. And it might be a post by an account with not very many followers, but the uh, Facebook algorithm will identify that as a sentiment that is likely to engage a large number of people if it pushes it out to a lot of people. So it will take that post and it will spread it to a large number of people 
on the news feed. And when it starts to attract likes and shares, it will spread it to more and more people. And it's doing this with many, many posts all at once. And then what happens is that if you are just a regular user on the platform in Myanmar, which is, this is something that I saw when I was on the ground there, you know, I went to Myanmar during the genocide and you would see people would log on to their Facebook, pull it up, and it would be saturated with these ultra violet viral posts expressing extreme hate and racism towards the Rohingya minority from these really small accounts. So it was this weird, like, why are these the posts that are going viral? Because it's the system that is pushing them out and promoting them to everyone. So if you're an individual user, it feels like that is what everyone thinks and what everyone feels, even if that's not the case, it's the platform is lying to you and it's just showing you the most extreme sentiment as if it's the consensus. And then that starts to feel real and it starts to feel, well, if everybody feels that way, I guess I feel that way too. And the way that this would interact with WhatsApp is a lot of people, especially in developing countries, but also in developed countries like the United States, who will use WhatsApp as a um, their primary communication tool uh, and use it, you know, big group chats that we're all on, um, but also use it to share news and information because it's zero rated in a lot of countries, which means even if you can't afford cell phone data, you can use WhatsApp for free. Facebook, the company, will just pay for your data to use it because they want you to spend your time on it. People would take a viral Facebook post that they saw because the platform shoved it in front of their face and send it out to their friends or their family members on WhatsApp and say, hey, I saw this, it seems really alarming, or I saw this and like, you know, we're all going to this village tonight to burn it to the ground. And then it would circulate and go viral on WhatsApp and then come back out on Facebook again. So it kind of bounced between these two networks. And this is something you see in a lot of countries happening over and over. In Myanmar, I think I know what you're referring to when you say when they turn off the platform. That was actually something they did in Sri Lanka. When I, oh, Sri Lanka. Okay. Identical. Right. Yeah. No, it's easy to get them confused because this happens over and over again in one country after another. So it's, you know, they do kind of blur together if you're not in these places. Um, in Myanmar, they refuse to turn the platform okay. off. Um, a, a reporter actually asked the head of the news feed at the height of the genocide when the United Nations is coming out and saying, Facebook, you are driving a genocide, please do something. A reporter asked the head of the news feed, why don't you consider just turning the platform off? Just try it, just see, you know, people are dying by the thousands, maybe it's worth a shot. And he said he didn't want to turn it off because he thought Facebook was doing too much good in the country, which I thought just spoke volumes uh, about the view from wow. Silicon Valley. But, but what happened in Sri Lanka, which is, you know, another country in Asia that had a, a history of a religious division that got really ramped up on Facebook and on WhatsApp through the spread of viral misinformation and hate speech and incitement is that as the this horrible violence was tearing through the country, also against the Muslim minority in Sri Lanka, the government in desperation shut down access to social media. That's like the one control they have is that because they control the flow of the internet in and out of the country, they can just hit a switch and say, you can't access Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, YouTube, from anywhere in Sri Lanka anymore. And when that happened, immediately the violence stopped. It just, the mobs went home, they stopped. It wasn't just they lost the ability to coordinate, but everything that was on there, this megaphone that they all had in their ears, mm -hmm. telling them to go out and commit violence just turned off. So that was it. And as soon as that happened, uh, a representative from Facebook finally called the government of Sri Lanka, which had been begging Facebook to intervene for months to do something. And they finally, Facebook got back to them and they said, well, why did traffic go away? Do you, what did you guys do to the traffic? And that was what finally got Facebook to respond to these pleas from government officials saying, your platform is tearing our country apart, please do something, was when they started to lose traffic. You, you know, when you hear the stories about it and what we lived through here in the 2016 election and then how it was used for misinformation leading to January 6th terrorist attack, a lot of people wonder why these, why is there not regulation? Not ban them, but and you even hear Democrats and Republicans sometimes both saying we have to do regulation of the platform for different reasons, but it never changes. In America specifically, what would you like to see? So there's been, I mean, I have to be careful how I put this because as a reporter for the New York Times, it, I'm not someone who's in a position to advocate for specific policies, but I can tell you what people who I've interviewed who are experts who work on this, what they tend to suggest. Um, and their suggestion is always that um, some version of turning off the engagement maximizing features 
And that's a very different conversation, the conversation the platforms want to have, and the conversation that in the past, not so much now, but in the past that government officials and regulators have had, which is always focused on moderation, which mm -hmm. is always focused on the conversation Silicon Valley wants to have is, you know, help us set better rules for what to remove or not remove from the platform and how to remove it. And Silicon Valley loves that conversation because it keeps us focused on this question of execution. And it keeps us focused away from the tougher question, which is that the profit driving parts of their technology, the, the like button, the algorithms that select what we see, uh, all of these features that are meant to make the product as engaging as possible. Those are like the, the chemicals that get added to cigarettes to make it addictive. And they don't want us sure. to ask about those. But when I would ask experts who study this, what are the things to get rid of? And they would say the chemicals in the cigarettes. They would say the, the algorithm, even Jack Dorsey, the head of Twitter before he left, he was saying, even you know, someone who was a, a, a diehard Silicon Valley free speech warrior was saying maybe having likes at the bottom of tweets was a mistake and that this is actually driving a lot of the harm. And you see even some folks in government, some members of Congress who are now circling around to that as the, the thing that they're focusing about. It's, it's very hard to, um, it, it's in some ways it's an easier answer because turning off the algorithm is it's much easier to, um, in theory, do than devising the perfect moderation policy, which is very hard. But it's also really tough to figure out how you would actually bring about because how do you get these giant companies, which are in some cases the largest, most profitable companies in human history, to turn off their profit drivers because they would they would never do it. Which is depressing on some level because our government should, could have the could enact some types of regulation, something along the lines, you know, there was one proposed by Congressman Ro Khanna, who's been on my show a bunch of times, a bill of rights for users. I'm like, that's a no brainer. You should have that because while it's not the government action, there's no due process. People get banned from Facebook and YouTube. And I don't mean conservative versus liberal type of thing. Like, they don't even know why. Like, oh, Facebook said, oh, I'm in the dog, or Twitter has, has banned me for a week and there's no recourse and, and no appeal process that you know of, or you don't know. I was banned once on Facebook for some kind of copyright stuff. That said, from two years ago, they said, we found this thing. I'm like, what, what is going on here? And it was not a ban, it was like a suspension. But I happen to know people at Facebook who I reach out to and they helped me and got it lifted. And if I didn't know anyone, who knows how long it would last? And then it would have had a strike against me if it happened again inadvertently. Uh, you know, I, I lose my access to Facebook. So, I mean, in the big picture before we wrap up, Max, which I do with Max Fisher about his book, The Chaos Machine, the inside story have social media rewired our minds in our world. I mean, are you, can social media be used for good? in a way that outweighs the bad, because the bad is very, very clear. And I don't know what the good is anymore, except that I, I post my articles and things about my show on it, but I don't really interact anymore on Facebook. I use it as like a billboard, I just post it and I leave, and if people want to fight on it, but can I'm not going to get engaged in it. So, there, I mean, there is, there is a lot of good that social media does, and at least in theory, the, the basis of the technology of something that connects all of us for free is something that is and can be very powerful. And I write about Me Too in the book, or I write about Black Lives Matter, about these kind of changes that have only been possible because of social media. But the thing that undercuts so much of that good, and a lot of folks argue uh, significantly overwhelms it, are the ways that the platforms are deliberately designed to pull out these uh, worst impulses, basest impulses, to inculcate us with these specific emotions and behaviors that we know and the people at the platforms know because their own researchers have been saying it for a couple of years now are overwhelmingly negative and harmful for us. So in theory, it's perfectly possible to have a social media that, that brings all the good without that bad. And it's that, it's that pre-2006 social media, you know, it existed, we had it, but right. the companies that ran that made very, very little money compared to what they make now. So there's there's no market for it. And uh, you know, that's that's capitalism, baby. I guess you're right. I mean, when I think back to MySpace, it was just a way to promote events and there wasn't fighting on it. And I remember Friendster, I think I signed up because a friend said sign up, but I never 